Um, but before we start, maybe just for the audiences here, uh, just to know what stage of careers you all are in. Maybe raise your hand if you're a graduate student. No grad students here? Maybe they're all attending online. Um, postdocs? Okay. And then scientists? Various. Okay. Cool. So now we know, um, I guess most of the audiences here are postdocs, but um, we might have people at different stages attending online. And I just want to um, start by um, you guys telling us about your or your experiences in publishing papers at different stages of your career. Like, how different do you feel them to be uh, as a grad student, as a postdoc, or as a scientist now? And if they're not different, that's also great. Just um, maybe a short summary of how you feel about publishing papers. <laughs> or, yeah. Go ahead. So, um, so I think means in my opinion, publications are the most impactful dissemination mechanism of our research. Means we can we also go to the conferences when we are we are working on projects. We also write reports. We make conference presentations. But I think that among these three dissemination mechanisms, publications are the most impactful because they are. They have the ab ability to reach a wide range of people in different countries among different platforms. And uh, they are trusted the most. Like, for example, when you go for your job search, and so the people, the first thing that the people will try to look in your CV is your publication record. Um, also, the funding agencies, they find uh, peer reviewed publications more attractive compared to reports or conference presentations. So if you have peer-reviewed publications, probably you have a better chance of um, securing funding. Not to say that the reports and conference presentations are not worthy, they are worthy as well. So in my career, I have given publications the topmost priority. Means if I'm working on something, I try to make sure that I get a publication out of it. Um, sometimes that puts extra pressure on me because as project scientists, we work on defined projects and our first priority is to meet the milestones and deliverables that the sponsor requires. So sometimes you run out of fund, you run out of funding, and you have to put in your own time to to write the paper and publish it. So that could be one challenge, especially in the project scientist job uh, that you can face. Uh, but I always make it my top priority to to publish. Um, Along the record, like when I, I was a graduate student, I think it took me more time to write a paper because I, I was not as familiar with the literature and the problems that I was trying to address. I was probably understanding the literature, understanding where the knowledge in the field was, and at the same time, trying to identify the best problems that I want to address during my PhD. So it took me longer time to write papers during my PhD. <coughs> And I think the process is getting a little easier with time as I'm building my scientific knowledge. And um, but so especially when you have you are working in a project scientist setting, when you have a defined project, so you already have the motivation. And, um, and you do a lot of work about the paper itself when you write the reports, the progress reports. So, so, so it, becomes a little, it has become a little easier now. I would not say that, um, that the quality has gone down, so we have to make sure that the quality stays there too. Um, we cannot just be um, publishing anywhere, so you have to, I, I try to maintain a like, okay, this is the journal that I want to go to, and I've, I've, I try to maintain that during in my publications. Okay, so it's good to hear that it does get easier with time, <laughs> Yes. Uh, despite, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess just a comment of like, uh, since a lot of postdocs especially haven't had experience in writing progress reports or, or proposals even, um, reviewing papers I think is really helpful because you can kind of figure out that perspective of someone from the outside who's going to be reviewing your paper and so that gives you um, a little bit of insight into how to structure your paper or give ideas on how to maybe avoid some of the criticisms that may come up. Um, so like, I think reviewing papers is a really good thing to do 
um, to as you're developing the sort of system that works best for you in writing papers. Um, and same thing with progress reports and asking your PI for the proposal that they wrote to support the grant and those sorts of things. So if you haven't gotten to a point where you're writing proposals in progress uh, reports, that's probably a good exercise to do to help out. Were you, uh, at what stage did you start writing proposals? Did you do that? Well, I think my first proposal was this like DOE graduate fellow okay. proposal, and then it was ASP fellow, and then the most recent grant. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to add to publications, I uh, didn't get into science because I love writing. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, and I still struggle with it. Um, but, you know, as you said, uh, publications are, are a really important metric of our career for jobs and also it just it reaches the most number of people um, that said also like you it's gotten easier because I've gotten more familiar with the literature but you know I've I sort of have switched into like oh this thing seems interesting all of a sudden I'm coordinating the development of the crop model but I didn't know much about agriculture before that and so to write my first paper related to agriculture type things, which I thought was a really interesting topic. I, it took me months to dig into the literature and to really, you know, get that foundation. And so those kinds of things are um, a real challenge. Um, I'm trying to think of, there were other things that I was gonna say, but I don't remember. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I just, I think that um, also reviewing papers is a good, a good thing to do and don't be hard on yourself. Reviewers, the, the review process never gets easier. You're getting rejected all the t time. <laughs> you know, and I, I will say, reviewing papers is a good thing. Um, and m maybe we'll come back to this, but that reviewer um, author relationship can be really hard because reviewers can be very helpful or very nasty and it ranges the whole <clears throat> spectrum. And so that's another thing that you have to deal with. Um, but I, oh, I remember the other thing that I was going to say is, for me, giving a presentation actually helps me structure the paper and it allows me to get feedback from the questions I get from the audience and um, comments that I get even after my talk to think about the additional types of things that I need to address. And so that helps me sort of frame the story that I'm going to write. And so I actually like giving presentations on the topic that I'm hoping to write a paper about beforehand. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Kind of coming back to what you were saying about the literature review being kind of one of the biggest hurdles, I guess I'm wondering if when you're writing about a topic you've never written about before, do you have some sort of approach with, oh, I'm going to write my results first and then do my literature review or? Um. Yeah, I mean, for me, it varies by <laughs> by the the paper and how I'm feeling about it. But, you know, I'm actually just starting this process with a new paper um, with a topic that I, I'm not as familiar with. And so I start off usually by reading other papers on the topic that are sort of key papers and trying to understand how are they framing it? What is the context? And then I often will dig into citations there. But yes, writing the results first can be somewhat helpful but I feel like I always am having to go back and forth between sections because I might change the results based on some of the context that I'm reading in the literature and thinking, oh, I should actually reanalyze this or, you know, add additional analyses. And so it does change in flow, but I feel like I usually have the figures that I think I'm going to write the paper and sort of a little bit about each. And then I, you know, I try to add that context um, so, so oftentimes after I have the results section outlined, I'll go back and try to write the introduction so that I have that bigger context and that actually helps me frame the whole paper and realize what additional information I might need in the results. Yeah, I think one thing that's helped me, and everyone will find a different system, Yeah, everyone will be different in how they think about their papers, but um, I like to like do my literature review and kind of keep a list of all the different papers that are somewhat relevant to whatever topic I'm doing. And so I'll just have a list of papers and like sort of, you know, two or three statements on the key things that relate to whatever it is I'm working on. And then when I go back, so then I write the results and like describe the results and then can go back and really pull out 
different lines from that first sort of list of findings from previous work and then can structure my introduction that way. So it's, it's kind of like, yeah, you do kind of go back and forth, but having that initial step I think is really good. Yeah. Does anyone have related questions? So I guess we did touch briefly on responding to the reviewers. And I think everybody <coughs> has had some experience in doing that. And maybe just to start, um, how do you deal with negative reviews? <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah, so um, when I, so, um, when I get the first review of my paper, um, however negative they are, I'm not mad at them. <laughs> so this is the first thing that I do. And, and the reason means there is, a, there is a reason I do that. Means when I read a paper, I have a lot of questions about the paper. So uh, if I am the reviewer of the paper and I'm doing a first reading and I get all, a lot of questions, I put down all the questions, that could be my first review. So the first review could be really out of the curiosity like maybe we get a reviewer who is not as familiar with the field as we are. So of course, going through the paper, the reviewer will have a lot of nasty questions. Maybe some things will not make sense to uh, those reviewers. So, the, so when I get the first review, if it is really negative one, then I, in my responses, I really try to respond like I'm responding to a fifth grader. <laughs> so explain e each and everything in your responses. And my experience has been such that when I do that, I have been successful almost every time. I think, so building on that, I mean, I do think it's important to explain everything, um, but you can get negative reviews. I was recently told in a review that, oh, thank goodness you're not lying anymore, you know? And so there are <laughs> people, yeah, I mean, you get really, I've also gotten a reviewer comment that said, clearly this person is not in the field of biology. And I was like, I'm getting my PhD in ecology. I don't know, you know? And so there are assumptions that reviewers make. And I will say, pay attention when you're writing reviews, please don't do that. It's, it's really yeah. rude to people. I also have been on a paper where the lead author is from, you know, from the US, native English speaker that was told, please have a native English speaker <laughs> review, you know? And it, I mean, it's just, those kinds of things are really obnoxious. And so um, keep that in mind. But what I will say, I, this last review that I was told that, thank goodness you're not lying. I mean, that whole review was really emotional and really personal. And so I had to write my snarky comments back and then delete the whole thing. <laughs> and, then, you know, and then go through step by step because really I think underlying any very negative review is, you know, even if you feel like you're right, there's something that the reviewer is picking up on that's maybe not as clear as it should be or something like that. And so I usually try to take a step back and, and you know, release my anger because I, I do get very frustrated and very angry with some of these reviewers. And just, and just to sort of take a step back and say, okay, what really are they trying to get at? And if there is a fundamental misunderstanding, you know, where you've you're like, yeah, but this reviewer is wrong. It's because there's, it's probably because there's something that's not explained very well in your paper. And so just trying to understand what that is. Um, and it's hard because reviewers don't always know how to articulate it. They're not taking a ton of time to review your paper. So keeping those things in mind, I think are um, just a really important part of the process and just trying not to take it personally, which is, I know, really hard, but I do think you kind of have to have a thick skin. The rejections get easier the more you get, unfortunately, <laughs> because you're always going to get them. I mean, we're taught to be critical in our reviews, and it's, it's, I feel like it's a rare thing where you will submit a paper for the first time and the reviewers will come back and say, oh, this is a great paper. I mean, if you think about when you're reviewing a paper, you're trying to help make it better, so you're almost also never going to say that, right? And so those are just things to keep in mind. Just follow up. Yeah. So, um, so to follow up on what you're saying, one, one thing I'm wondering about is when you do get a negative review, mm -hmm. in addition to these strategies for dealing with, you know, your frustration and their rudeness and things like that, um, do you, how have you found, or how, who, who and how have you found people to help you 
you know, move through it because I look back on papers that I wrote where I, I ended up dropping it because I didn't have, I guess I didn't have the gumption <laughs> or somebody to tell me like, no, like write back to the editor or send it to another journal. Oh. And so I ended up abandoning a few papers, which now I think, oh, too bad I can go back and say that. Yeah. yeah. And find people who can help you with that. I mean, that is, a, that is a really important thing to have a community of people that you can talk to about that. And I, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's finding the right people, right? But also knowing that your paper is going to be publishable, just maybe not in the journal that you thought, and it might require some significant reworking and or some additional analyses or, you know, and you have to try and understand where the reviewer is coming from. Because most, I mean, almost all of the time, my paper has been made better by reviewer comments. It hurts. It kind of sucks when you you're so proud of your work and you're putting it out there and then it's rejected and trashed. <laughs> you're like, oh man. But um, but I think there's some determination that goes into it, and I think that there is the support of um, your peers and also you know the community. I remember my very first paper getting rejected, and the person that I talked to about it said that almost never happens. And it was like, what papers never get rejected? And then it just made me feel even worse. But then I went back to my peers in grad school and they were like, oh yeah, I've had like, I've had to resubmit to four or five different journals because it's gotten rejected so many times. And that, you know, so your peers and your friends are just as important in this process, I think, as um, your mentors. Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe even more so because they're more at sort of the level that it's going through. And I will also say it, de it varies by field. When I try to submit papers to the physiological literature, like physiological, plant physiological literature, that is much, much, much more likely to get rejected than if I submit something to a modeling, a modeling based thing. And so it really does vary by field. And I, I think that there's different cultures within different fields. And so keep that in mind as well when talking to other people, you know, like the person who said that almost never happens was in the modeling field, and so. Yeah, so the other person to talk to is the editor. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think in general, they're on your side, like they want to help, and they want to have more journals, you know, they want to have more articles in their journal. So I think being able to have like a candid conversation with them of like, hey, you know, do you think this is something I should resubmit, or should I move on, you know, and then, do the same thing with your peers who you know are gonna give you an honest answer of like, hey, can you just take a look at this? Like, is it really alarmingly bad? Or <laughs> is it something that can be matured into something that's ready to go? Um, and the other thing I just wanted to, to mention, disconnecting personally is like number one step for really review hard. process. And whenever you submit a paper, like like Donica was saying, like you should expect that they're gonna, they're gonna have criticisms <coughs> Because that's our job as a reviewer is to really dig in and make sure they're they're dotting their eyes and crossing their T's. Like that's that's the job of the reviewer, so that they become really good articles that have long lasting influence. And so I think it's you should expect that when you get a review back, that you should get some sort of feedback. Um, otherwise, like whenever I, if I get a reviewer who like didn't have a lot of feedback, I'm like, oh, it's probably like a graduate student or someone who like doesn't know the field very well or something like that, when I get something with a lot more thorough feedback, I'm like, cool, I'm glad they got somebody who like knows their stuff, like sucks like point A through F, but you know, there's more work for me to do, but that's okay, kind of thing. Yeah, but, one thing I would like to add is like, if you get a really negative review and even after talking to the editor, editor says, no, you should not resubmit to this journal. When you go to another journal, try to address at least the major comments that you get from the previous review. Yeah. So that will him that will improve the quality of the paper and maybe the review process will get easier in the next journal. Yeah. It's true. I have yeah. had a paper rejected though because they just didn't like the results and they had no no other comments and so in that case I couldn't. So in those cases and also the cases that people are just plain rude um, in the reviews, do you contact the editor too or point that out in your response saying I, I really didn't I tried to. In the so in this last, I mean this this last um, round, the paper is actually still in review, and so we'll see what the <laughs> next round is. But I um, 
I had one round of reviews where I got that, like, oh, now you're not lying, mm -hmm. kind of, it, just that visceral mm -hmm. <laughs> response. And I sent it, I sent it back, and I actually asked a couple of people, I said, should I request not having this reviewer again? And I got sort of mixed responses, and I don't know if there is a right answer. Um, I got mixed responses, and so what I ended up doing at the sort of encouragement of a few people that I talked to was in my cover letter back to the editor saying, you know, this these reviews were not helpful, they were too emotional, and they weren't very helpful. But the editor still sent it back to that same reviewer, and then it got rejected because that reviewer was just very, you know, it was, this is on a crop model and an earth system model, and that person was in a, you know, was an agronomic modeler and said so in the review, and, you know, was just like, I don't think you should have crop models in earth system models, and that was, you know, why. But the, in that case, even though that review came back saying rejected, and the editor basically said, we're rejecting this, but please resubmit. And then, and then I had to write a letter to the editor, as you said, saying, I'm confused by this because I can't really address comments, which is, you know, you don't think that there should be a crop model and an our system model. I can't address that because that's exactly what we did. But the editor, you know, from just that correspondence said, yes, I would really like you to resubmit because she was very supportive of this. It just was, given that review process, that was kind of how she had to deal with that, logistically yeah, yeah that logistical problem and so you know having those conversations with editors can be good and can be useful um but it, it is hard and i was i was actually sort of confused by the response yeah. um but writing back to the editor i also know that for some journals um sometimes people will repeal the editor's decision and um write back an appeal and a lot of times that doesn't work but occasionally it does yeah so yeah it, it worked for us recently i'm co-author on a paper and so we got the reviews and the one of the reviewers said we cannot trust the observations they made and uh, so then we wrote back to the editor and we said okay these are the measurements made using this and this technology and this technology is well proven it works on top of that we have applied this and this quality control to to control the quality of our observations so if that is the basis of rejecting the manuscript we will we feel that it's unfair and so then the editor wrote back to us and she said like um i am not particularly worried about this comment but then she pointed out a couple of other comments that was the basis of her decision to reject. And then we made a response to those comments and then she reopened uh, the manuscript in the journal. Okay. So some, yeah, it occasionally works. Most of the time it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the editors are also very helpful. For example, I was the reviewer on one paper and I read the paper, I recommended major revision. The authors addressed my comments and when I got the second evaluation, I put minor revision and accept. And then somehow there was a third version. Maybe the other reviewers had still major concerns and the concerns of the major, the other reviewers, they eliminated all of the recommendations that I made yeah. in the first round. So when the third version came to me, I still saw all the mistakes that were in the first version. So I again recommended major revision. And then the editor called me up and he said, I'm confused by your review because uh, first you say major revision, then you say minor and accept, and now you again say major revision. So then I explained to the editor like uh, that this is what happened and that's why I, that is the basis for my decision. And then the editor asked me like, uh, but what is your opinion on the overall quality of the paper? Do you think that it is worthy of being published in this journal? I said, yes, if these comments are addressed. And then the editor made sure that they addressed the comments and the paper was published. Okay. There are comments and questions from online, by the way. Yeah, um, maybe Olivia go first. How do you think, so in the past I've prioritized editors who I trust, but how do you do that? Do you prioritize editors? Do you prioritize the journal, the prestige? In terms of tr deciding where to yeah, submit? Yeah, where to publish. I mean, I think it, I've mainly been in the atmospheric science journals, so I'll say that. Um, so a AGU, so that's Journal of Geophysical Research, and then Geophysical Research Letters, 
And then for AMS, it's the Journal of Atmospheric Science. Those are like the main journals I've led, led papers in. And the, the decision on that has mainly been driven by who's going to read this journal. So AMS is typically more meteorology. And then geo, geophysical, the AGU is more all Earth system. So, and then in terms of the GRL, those were papers where I had pretty concise messages that I could summarize into a very short article. And those are great, like, especially as a reader, GRL article, like, every day, you know? <laughs> or, like, a <laughs> or a reviewer. Yeah. <laughs> or a reviewer, yeah. <laughs> or a reviewer. Or reviewers can sometimes be hard. But no. um, the, so the differences are, like, things where, you know, with the GRL, it's shorter messaging or more, more concise, and then you have this extra supplemental material. Um, and then for, in terms of, like, editors, I don't know, I think in general I've had good experience with all the editors, and it, I don't know, if you have a bad experience, then, you know, you kind of knock that off of, like, okay, that's not someone I want to submit under, but <laughs> in the future, you know. So following up on that, has any of you had trouble with an editor? I now have a paper under review, and the editor doesn't respond to my emails. Mm. Does that happen? And, and I've had it happen before, and I send, then I send an email to um, like the executive yeah. editors, and no one ever responds. No. Maybe it just shouldn't uh, submit to that. Journal. Maybe there's yeah. um, other staff members yeah. that you could CC on there. And but I don't know them. How do you find out about Oh, them? you, don't, you haven't gotten don't any email. Don't people who like send you the like. Yeah, like by extension, right? If I ask for an extension, they will send me an extension, but I never got an extension. So for one mm -hmm. journal, I've done that, and I know now this person who granted the extension. And But for this other journal, they just never replied, like not even a staff member or anyone. So mm -hmm. I don't know who that Here, would I would be. avoid that journal in yeah. the future. Yeah. <laughs> just note <laughs> that down. It's like a... <laughs> I mean, there are journals I avoid for that reason because things take really long or, you know, the editors are unresponsive. Um, but I don't, I haven't focused quite as much on looking for editors. I focus a little bit more on the journal and, you know, like you were saying, Christina, what the readership of the journal is, like, who is it going to reach? Because even though you can search almost any, you know, you can search by topic now online. And so anybody can find articles in any journal, but people still do sign up and get table of contents for certain journals. And so there are things that you're gonna see. And so that's, um, you know, but then also where does it fit within a journal? And again, like you were saying with the GRL or the ERL or even the nature, nature climate change, those kinds of journals, those are shorter, concise messages um, that are really nice. They're nice to write, they're nice to read, they're nice to, if you're a reviewer, they're nicer to review because usually they're written pretty well. Um, and then there are the longer ones, like I've also gone to geoscientific model development and places like that for, you know, those kinds of things. And so it, it also sort of depends on the category. But if you know the editors and trust them, it's going to be great there. I did have one experience, though, where I thought I knew and trusted the editor and I had one associate editor say you should submit this paper to this journal. And then the overall editor, whoever, whatever that position is called, rejected it with a, and this was while I was a graduate student with one line saying it doesn't fit within the scope of this journal and there are serious problems and that was it and I was <laughs> I was a little bit horrified by the very much lack of response but just telling me that there was something wrong with the paper but not actually telling me what it was um, and it took three months to get that one line response which was also really disheartening and disappointing because I assumed that it was out for review but it was just with the editor the whole time so you know I think it I, I do think it really varies I think also asking your co-authors like hey do you know of any like special editions or um, what what do you think would be an appropriate journal and then you know pricing sometimes maybe plays a role too so yeah, so we have a question from... I just want to say this is really great to hear these stories. I just do think, like, it's great to hear the problems and to know you're not alone. I'm sure people are feeling yeah. like, oh, I'm not the only one who had to wait three months for a <laughs> response that wasn't <laughs> one even that review. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, so um, the first question is, how do you identify key papers on a new topic? This was following on an earlier comment. Starting with a review paper, and in the lit review, do you read all the papers entirely or just skim? And that's from Chris Cruzy. 
So um, yeah, obviously start from a review paper. And uh, personally, um, I don't go through the whole paper. I pay the most attention to the abstract and then the summary. And then I quickly skim through the figures. And then I try to write down the important messages uh, from all the papers so that I, I can come up with a summary of the knowledge that exists in the field at that point. And then I try, I put up that against my understanding of the subject and try to find new problems that I can address. I, I would say it, use a review paper if it's within the last like two years. Because usually if a review paper is written more than two years ago, there's a whole bunch of more studies that have come out. I mean, not always, but it can be. And so I think that's a good starting point. But then looking at some of the key papers that were referenced for the topic that you're specifically looking at and then going and searching for those and see who cited them and then go and, and dig into those. But I agree, like reading every single paper is probably impossible yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> from start to finish. And, and then there's usually like a couple papers where you do read all the way through and you, you look at the technical details and things like that, but the majority of them are, oh, I remember this figure, let me go look back and see what they exactly plotted and what the assumptions were, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but. I think that both of those, everything that both of you said is really accurate and I want to just highlight that it points out as a writer how important your abstract is yeah. because that yes. is what people are reading. So pay attention to that. And your figures. <laughs> yeah, when you're writing your paper. And yeah, and make your figure legends um, readable. But, you know, to, to follow up on that when I'm diving into a new topic, yes, I read the abstract. I go through a lot of papers. And I usually I start with one paper that has, you know, been key in helping me to think about this in the first place. And then I look at what they cite, you know, and I'll look at the figures and then I say, okay, how did they do this? And so I'll go back to the methods or maybe I'll read the results or the discussion. But a lot of times um, introductions are actually very helpful because they give you an overview. And so then I look at the papers that they cite in the introduction and I will go back. And so um, abstract figures introduction for me yeah. is, is really what I focus on when I'm getting into a new Area. And this is, I was just doing this yesterday, reading a couple of key papers and then going through the introduction and looking up the other papers that they were citing. So, I have another question from a remote person. Um, do you review papers that are not exactly of your area of expertise? If so, do you have any tips for reviewing such papers without feeling and not adequate enough to give the review? <laughs> That's from Emma Yarvanen. I, yeah, I, I've never done that. I mean, see if I feel that this is outside my expertise and I cannot do a justice to the paper, so I generally decline it. And because the journals always give you the option to recommend other reviewers who mm -hmm. would be suitable for that. Paper. I think if it's going to require you to spend a lot of time looking up literature, maybe avoid it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. Is it depends on how far outside yeah. my field because, you know, there are things like I got something on, like, plant transcriptomes that there's no way, you know, I don't know anything about that. But, you know, another paper that was sort of um, tangential to what I do, but related enough that I could probably understand it, then I will, if, if I feel like I have time, then I will try to review it. And, you know, sometimes actually that can help you help the author clarify the message because if you don't understand something you know the people other people reading it might also might not understand it so it just I think it depends on how far away from your field is if it's really a topic that you don't know much about at all or is like really on the edge then I would say don't do it but if it's within a, a scope of you know I understand how models work and so I can understand some other aspect about this model that might not be my like plant-based focus maybe it's on soil moisture or something like that you know that might be relevant enough that I can yeah and as a reviewer if you end up getting to a point where because a lot of times you can't see the full manuscript until you're already committed to reviewing it so if you get to that point you can still give like an overall cursory review of like the structure of the paper and whether or not it's clear but then you can also communicate to the editor by the way, I just read through this and I realized that you really need to make sure that at least one of your viewers is an expert in ice nucleation because I don't actually know anything about that. You know, so so that's another mm -hmm. thing to, to note for reviewing reviewing papers outside of your main research. Thanks. And we have 
question in the back. Yeah, so actually I had a bad experience in publishing a paper in ACP. Rajesh was the co-author. So actually we submitted a journal, uh, we submitted that uh, publication in July 2017 and we got first response from reviewer in August 2017. But then for next six months there was a silence. So we wrote three emails to editor and there was no response. He just said, you will get review soon, you will get review soon. And uh, I got the next review in February 2018. And those comments were exact, they were, most of them were exactly similar to the previous ones. And they just, uh, they have commented each and every line that it has this problem, that problem, and that was a too long of a review. And then they said you should make all these changes and submit within one month, which was very, you know, difficult to do. So we, although we asked for extension and finally it got published in August 2018, but it took too long and it was really bad experience for me. So I was curious how to deal with such situations because in, in my case, even editor was not helpful. Yeah, yeah but I, I would like to, because I was a co-author on the paper and I was involved in the whole process. So it was a really weird review process. Um, one of the reviewers said, this paper is a duplication of the other paper. And so we got that serious comment. And so first I was surprised that it is not rejected. It was put to major revision because if if the reviewer feels that it's a duplication. But I was happy that we get a chance to respond. So we made a point by point response on what this what new knowledge this paper is providing. And after we submitted our responses, the editor even did not even send it back to the reviewers for their feedback and just accepted it. <laughs> so it was good for us, but it was a really weird review process. Yeah. ACP, it's a the open access journals uh, could be really tough sometimes because they have a lot of they have a lot of papers that are submitted that they have to uh, and they have a like limited editorial board. So um, I had one experience in in the same journal in 2015. So I submitted a paper and they were not able to find an editor for one month. And at that point, they wrote back to me and they said we are unable to find an editor. Either you find an editor yourself or <laughs> you withdraw the paper and submit to another journal. So I was ready to withdraw it and send it somewhere else. But one of my co-authors said, I know a couple of editors, so let me write to them. So she wrote to a couple of editors and one of them agreed to handle the manuscript. And then we got the reviews. After we submitted our responses, the editor, she was pregnant, so she went on medical leave, so the paper was again abandoned. <laughs> and um, and then, so the, the executive board, they reached out to the editor and they said, um, because you have been handling the process the whole time and we understand it, you have a medical reason for you to leave, but please finish this paper. And she again did the same thing, she just accepted it. So I have had, I've, experienced these two two weird things and since then I have never sent a paper to you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's two of two? Yeah. Mm. It's, um, I've, I've heard of this consistently with ACP. So huh. these, yeah. ACP is atmosphere chemistry and physics. It's yeah. not only open access, but it's open discussion. Yeah. And so if your paper is rejected, it's dead. You can't submit it unless you... No, you can... Really, yeah. you can't resubmit it to another journal unless you really change it. Yeah, I think you can you can ask ACP um, to to kind of remove it from their website to remove it from the open discussion phase. We had one paper where we had three rounds of reviews and it was rejected, and then we went to we went to another journal for submission, and after the submission, the journal said, "Oh, your paper is already on the ACP website, so you need to ask them to take it down," and so we did that, and then the, it is under review in the other journal. Yeah, I think you can. It's just an extra step. Yeah. But I've talked to editors at Open Access Journals who have said, I really try to be hard as the initial editor and reject it right away if it's not good enough, but not all editors are the same. So. Yeah. yeah, I had the same experience in like it took so long because it seems that they have, they have a pool. So they put all of the papers over there. So editors go and find whatever is interesting to them. 
and then it's like another pool for reviewers like they, they should also so that's like it takes too long but this raises another question that if we have like a table that what is the timeline of yeah. journals usually because my experience with them it took like maybe four months or three months for editor and then reviewers maybe two three months and then after that things were nice and they were really good with uh, comments and really it's a useful one and with the extension they were really good so is there like uh, such a thing so we know like first of all which one they give you an extension because sometimes that's necessary because you don't want to have like a very firm deadlines and like how like other journals like when you submit it's like a sent like it's always you get editor or you all might also get into considering that that's really related to that journal so what was what what do you what is your idea about that i think it's all over the board it is. Yeah. yeah, I think it really depends on the journal, and it also depends within the journal on the editor. Um, and so those things are hard, and I've had, you know, I mean, there are journals that, in my section, terrestrial sciences section, <laughs> like, don't submit to global biogeochemical cycles. They take years, <laughs> you know, and um, but then there are others that are so fast and, and turn around really quickly. And I think, at least for me, I just anticipate that it's going to be a long process. Yeah. And it really sucks when you're a graduate student or a postdoc to know that you have to wait that long because the publications <clears throat> at that point in your career are really important because you don't have as many of them at that point and you want to get a job. And so, <laughs> you know, and that's, um, that is a real struggle and a real challenge. Yeah. But you so just have like to. This, you know, with AGU and AMS, how was their time? Very about? different. It was like all over the board and it's been different with uh, uh, when I'm co-authors on other papers, you know, it's, uh, it's also different. I don't even think there's really a seasonality to it. It's like there's so many parameters that go into figuring out how long it's going to take. It also can take a long time to find specific reviewers. So like there was a paper where we had a new technology that like we developed and there are like four people in the world who probably could give us an actual good review and probably three, two or three of them have conflicts of interest with someone on the on the author list, you know? So I think it's really hard for them to find reviewers as well. Yeah. So is those are... Accepting reviews outside of your comfort zone can sometimes be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we ended up having somebody who was very, well, <laughs> very good for reviewing that part of the paper. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's all over the board. I think the main thing to remember is, like, publications are a marathon, period. Like... It is. It takes so long to get your research even to a point where you can write a paper, and then once you submit it and get it to the point where it's available, that it's it's such a long process. Mm -hmm. But it feels really good when you finally <laughs> get it. <laughs> I have a question uh, from Daniel Kennedy. Um, one obstacle to publishing is deciding when your figure set, um, and I think he also means data has coalesced into a meaningful story for publication. Is there a way to develop more confidence in identifying when you've reached that point, as opposed to endlessly iterating through new anal analyses? <laughs> I'm having this problem right now, because <laughs> I'm doing something totally new, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's a hard thing, but that's where I think going and giving presentations yeah. and talking to people can actually really help, because it helps you to formulate your data into a story that you have to tell. And I, I feel like it's easier to do, at least for me, in presentation format than it is writing a paper and then realizing that through the writing process, although I've done it through both. But you get feedback then, yeah. and this can be just to your peers. It can be um, research reports. We have those in CGD. I don't know if you have them elsewhere. Um, it can be, you know, at a conference, but just, just trying to do that, I think, can help help you iterate through um, that process. Yeah, another thing to think about is a lot of journals now want like three key points. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can have one sort of like baseline, like every piece of data supports this one, and then maybe two of those, and then one that's sort of like, we're kind of spreading ourselves thin here, but this is what we think could be an interesting avenue. Like, so having two, one or two, like, really good, this is so supported by our study, and then one that's sort of a little bit more liberal, you know, yeah. um, I think is also a good, cool. yeah. Yeah, I also generally follow that approach. 
means when you have two solid points at that point, I say to myself, okay, I think it is worthy of a shot. So you submit it and sometimes the reviewer comes back to you and they ask like, okay, this piece is missing. And then it is safe to say, I mean, I, I do that most of the time that, okay, this, this needs a new analysis and we are pursuing that analysis. Sometimes I even have figures from, from my new analysis that I submit in my responses that we are doing this and then there will be another paper coming out of, out of it on that. So that is to tell the reviewers that the analysis has not stopped, but whatever the problem we are discussing, it is worthy of two papers. And so we will have another paper soon. Yeah, and I think kind of going back, on the, like what we're talking about for reviews is really being able to be clear going into it that these are the, these are the facts that yeah. support my key points. So that whenever somebody, I also had somebody would say like, this is a repeat of your previous paper. And I was just like, what? Like, no, like, you didn't read either of these or I don't know what happened. <laughs> like, you know? And, and I think being able to say like, this is what we knew. This is the literature right now. And without this piece, this is what's missing. And this is what we're filling. And so I think like sticking to the facts and saying like, you know, X, Y, and Z, therefore this, like, I think that's generally a good guideline. Yeah, and another, another thing that I, I normally do with my papers is uh, once I have the first draft ready, I read it from a reverse perspective, yeah. and I, I ask myself, why would I reject this paper? <laughs> and then if something comes to my mind, I try to address it before submission. Yeah, I'm always surprised though by, I try to do that with mine as well, and I still get comments that I'm not <laughs> anticipating at all. And I'm always surprised by my co-authors also, you know, you know, also when I'm a co-author on a paper, I try to think about it from a reviewer's lens, but I don't, yeah. we still miss things that other yes, reviewers of course. say. So yeah, even if you are confident that this is a very good paper, you still get a lot of comments and you are, you end up in major revision. <laughs> uh, Curtis, do you still have a question? Yeah, so kind of back to the comment, we discussed a lot about issues with reviewers and editors, but I wanted to ask, how do you deal with any conflict or disagreement among the co-authors of a paper <laughs> with respect to maybe one of the original manuscript, but then also in how you respond to reviewers, um, where you push back or where you compromise? So if you could speak to that. Stick to the facts. And a lot of times it's a lot of language. So like being like, these data indicate that X, Y, or Z, versus these data mean like this is definitely happening or you know this data supports the idea that this may be you know like just basic little word changes can oftentimes please <laughs> um, both reviewers and co-authors um, but again like sticking to the facts of this is what we have so this is why this is the way we're putting this it's know? still really hard though because people can interpret facts in different ways and um, you know, I experienced that. I had a paper where I had two co-authors on opposite extremes where I was showing this model process has this sensitivity just to sort of say, you know, we don't know much about this, but we need to better understand. And I had one co-author who said, this absolutely needs to be in the models. It's very important. Here's all the data that we're collecting to measure. And another one that said, we don't know anything about this. This process needs to be taken out of the model. And you need to say that in your paper. And I didn't want to go either way. And I think ultimately what it comes down to, and this is harder to do as you're earlier on in your career, but is having the confidence to say, this is what I'm going to stick to. And yeah. sticking to the facts a lot of times is a good thing, but just being able to explain clearly and I mean sometimes it might mean that people want to be taken off of your paper if there really is that strong of a conflict and you have to be okay with that it's hard it sucks but um it's not a personal thing <laughs> or it shouldn't be at least um so the other thing is getting on the phone like not just doing it over email but being like hey can we set up a conference call to figure out how we're going to agree to address this reviewer and say you know like lay out the facts and everyone kind of be able to voice their opinion and also potentially bend a little easier. I think email, it's so easy to disconnect and just be like, I'm just gonna <laughs> give my thoughts, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's so much more organic to, de to decide on a, an agreement if you're on the phone. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with um, what Paul M said. Um, when I have this conflict, I give myself a couple of days. Inside, if I get such a comment, then I don't think about it for two days because sometimes it makes me mad. And so first you, I just let my anger go away and then think more strategically about it. 
before talking to my co-authors. Yeah, I often have to walk away from reviews, from yes. conflicts, for that exact reason. Yeah. Because it can take, it helps you take the emotion yeah. out of it. Yeah. Curtis, could you, if, if you're comfortable, could you share with us um, how you handled it and what happened? Sure. So, my specific experience, and Jared knows a little about this, um, he helped me with the process, but so, it was a manuscript from my dissertation, and there was a debate about the color palette used and how accessible we wanted to be. Um, we wanted to advocate for consistency of using a rainbow palette similar to what National Weather Service already uses. However, one of the one of the reviewers had a comment on changing it to more of like a grayscale pattern, um, and one of the co-authors who outranked me um, certainly felt that we should kind of simply go with what the reviewer wanted and not push back for consistency. So um, Jared actually helped me with looking at something called, and I think color oracle? Co uh, color palette, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, it's a little app where you can, at least on, on Mac, and I believe it might be on, on other platforms too, where you can just in a little menu bar show, okay, what does my screen look like in these various color blindness modes? So that you can see, are the colors that I have on my figure, are they distinguishable if someone has one of these forms of color blindness or grayscale, you know, so that you can really um, make figures that are intelligible and I discernible. you can just say, to, in response to the reviewer, this is acceptable we, based we, on, you know. We looked at this, and so what we ultimately ended up doing was, um, so I, I showed this tool to the co-author who felt like we should just accommodate the reviewer. Um, it actually was a much broader discussion about accessibility in manuscripts for kind of different issues, colorblindness being one of them. And we found that by simply changing the hue of the color slightly, we were able to keep kind of a similar rainbow scale but it was discernible to those with color blindness, and we actually reached out to some other um, some other colleagues that had color blindness and said, you know, here's kind of a couple versions of this figure. Which ones look best to you? So um, it it certainly was a difficult one to address that whole, you know, do we push back or do we just kind of accommodate? But um, definitely, it was an insightful conversation and learned a new tool out of it as well. So yeah, thank you, Jared. And how did the reviewer respond? The reviewer, kind of after that, the reviewer appreciated the time and effort. Um, and we put a kind of lengthy response. And the reviewer <laughs> said, you know, I'm glad, yeah. like, I'm happy that you, know, you reached out to other people and that they were fine with this change. Yeah. Um, I think some, it, yeah, and I mean, sort of related to that, but, you know, some of it does come down to personal preference, and that's a that's a hard thing thing but this yeah. it, it sounds like you sort of went about it in trying to think about people who might not be able to see the figures as clearly and that's um, a very helpful way to think about it as well and I feel like you know going back to what Christina said earlier that's part of you know going with the facts is you know people who are colorblind might not be able to see this scale versus this scale and so that's why we chose this yeah another comment just you mentioned about a, a co-author wanting to sort of just bend whatever the reviewer was asking. I think it's your job as the lead author or even a co-author to support the work that you guys have intended to do. And there are a lot of times when reviewers are just simply missing something and they think that the, the paper will be better or they think that this is like a simple thing to add, but it's not or it wasn't the point of your paper or like you just fundamentally disagree with them. And I think it's really important for you to, you owe it to yourself to because of all the work that you've put into it to, to keep to what you want and try to find a creative way to satisfy that reviewer or give lengthy responses, things like that. Otherwise, you'll look back on the paper and then in the future and be like, oh, I hated that we did that or, you know, whatever. Oh, um, so you touched, you touched on that a little bit. Um, how do you navigate co-authorship? And does that get, I guess that gets easier as more as like you climb up the career ladder, but I I just found that during my master's and then also my PhD, you're in a very dependent position ultimately, and and it is very easy for, I, I think the Thai guidelines are that just because somebody's funding you, that doesn't mean they automatically are in your paper, if they haven't contributed anything to the actual paper, but that was challenged a lot during that time, and that was really difficult because I'm dependent on that, right? And, 
So. Right. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a challenge and it can be a challenge and it's hard when people don't contribute anything and still want to be a co-author, but the way that I think about it is in the end, adding an extra person, it doesn't do yes. the paper any harm. This is true. And so, <laughs> you know, it's, I just sort of feel like, okay, well, if you've, and I mean, in some respects, if they're, if they've done all the work to write the proposal and, and get the funding and acquire that funding, the work wouldn't have been possible without them. So, you know, maybe that is okay. It doesn't, I don't know that it always entails that. And not everybody who acquires the funding is going to require being on the paper. So that's a, a personal preference thing. But I think in the end, what I found is that it fighting that makes people feel worse and resentful towards you. And really all it is is another name on your paper. And so I don't know that it's worth fighting that too much. But in terms of thinking about who should be on your paper, you know, that's a that's a sort of a slightly different question, which is, of course, anybody who has contributed, or even if they haven't necessarily contributed to the analysis, if you think that they can contribute positively and give really insightful feedback to framing your paper and really putting it in context because they have some sort of expertise in that area, I think can also they can also be um, really helpful co-authors. Yeah. Yeah, even if like somebody means really helps you in the in the discussion stage, like you wrote you wrote a draft and you share with them and they provide really useful feedback, then I think it's a good idea. It, it, I, like Danica said, it doesn't do any harm if you add one more person at the end um, of the paper. So um, sometimes you get you get into another situation like you really you really want to get feedback from from some person. And I think it also comes down to like individual morality that they still give you feedback, but they say that I've not contributed to the paper, so please don't put me on it. Mm -hmm. So I think you get both the situations. Sometimes you have to make that compromise that adding one more person to the list doesn't do any harm. And then you also have to decide like whether it is worth fighting to put your energy and time into just deciding whether to add one more name or not because you can use that time for your other things that you are doing. Yeah, I mean, I guess the experience I had was like a person that consistently, like on my, not only the paper that was in the end, but on my talks and on my posters and like never ever contributed anything. And at mm -hmm. some point it becomes this like, just someone I get resentful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I think that's like, like your cue to figure out a way out of the situation where you have to collaborate with them. Yeah. So cause I've been in similar situations where it's like, People email me like I should be last author, I should be further up again in the list, and and you know one of my advisor at the time sort of literally laughed at this person because he was like I wish I had time to worry about that, I wish I had time to worry about my rank in the author list on a paper that I don't even really I haven't even really contributed to, so I think that in general there are always going to be people like that, and like like I think this is a really key point is that in the end it doesn't really affect anything. And just know that there are some people like that. And whenever I'm even tangentially working with this person now, I'm always like, I would like to invite you to be a co-author if you think it's appropriate. And then that person can decide, you know, what they want. I think, but, I think that that's a really important point, though, is thinking about who your collaborators yeah. are. Um, because it's, you will find that you, um, there are certain people that are just no fun to work with at all. And, you know, somebody who is constantly requiring to be put onto things without contributing anything, that's a really tough situation. And you just, you know, while you're doing the work that they fund you, you just kind of have to grit your teeth and move forward with that. But, you know, like yeah. Christina said, getting out of that situation is a, a good thing. And it can also, it can be hard in the other way where somebody wants to be on and then wants to give all sorts of comments and is really opinionated about it. And that situation also happens and that's, another really hard situation where you just have to try and appease people to the best of your ability. And, you know, I mean, I think some of it comes down to these personalities that really just want to be in the center of everything. And part of it is they just need to be recognized and need to be heard. And then they're, they're a lot easier to deal with. And so it's just a sort of like a people management yeah. <laughs> problem that we shouldn't have to deal with as scientists, but we do all the time. Um, so, but but I will say, choose your collaborators carefully if you can help it. And sometimes you can't, but if you can, it's it's a really 
important thing to think about. And I think the main goal as the lead author or even co-author is just to make sure that the people who did contribute significantly are recognized in the appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And that's all you can really do. And if you are a co-author, make sure that you're meeting the expectations that you would expect from your co-authors. So, like, you're reviewing the paper. You can give a presentation on it. You can, you know, describe the paper in some way. I think it's good. Okay. Can I ask about, you said acknowledge them in an appropriate way, so like a general way, because so I was wondering about this at lunch the other day, that um, in, in the field that I was in before, uh, a while ago, the funding person, or the person with, yeah, the basically the person with the funding, so who wrote the proposal who had the initial idea, would always go last, um, and that would sort of indicate that they, they were in some way the most important one, not writing it, but starting this work. But then sometimes that ends up that people who contributed to this paper um, because they supported me in some sort of technical way or something, they, they move in front of it, just be in front of this person, just because I think I thought that the last position was the most, so apart from the first, the last would be the most important. So I was like, there's some confusion about how, what is the order? I think it's just a matter of asking. So it's preference, yeah. 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 Also, it's, it's not. Yeah, you would. So there the is no defined is rule yeah. for this. I think it's just a matter of preference. I think it changes field by field yeah. too, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. Is I think it does change by field, and there are some, and because there's so much crossing of fields in what all of us do, I think it does depend on the personal preference. And so my PhD advisor always wanted to be the last author, even though he contributed more than some other people. But you know, I'm on a lot of papers that have like. 50 authors, right? And they're not going to be the last author on that. And so in that case, what I've seen people do is the people who contribute most are the first whatever, and then everybody else is in alphabetical order mm -hmm. after that. So, you know, there's I think that there's different strategies, and I think talking to some of the people is helpful, the, the key players, I would say, and then the other people who are maybe not as key, then you say, this is what I'm doing, and yeah. you can explain it. Helps. Yeah, I think asking again, like the, taking care of your key people is like I think the number one. Do you assume when you read a paper? Do you assume that the last person is the person? With the no, I don't really no. pay attention too much. To <laughs> also, the other the other factor that plays in is if they're faculty or if they're at a science lab, because a lot of times they count how many papers your first author and how many papers your last author. So that's like an actual mm -hmm. metric, and some of the faculty track uh, departments, and so that's why sometimes people really care. Because it's like, I acquired the funding, and so I need this to count towards my numbers or whatever. So okay. I think just asking up front and giving people the opportunity to state their preference is the number one. Yeah. Like, and, and now the journals, a lot of journals are, you know, when you submit your paper, you say, you know, my co-author did, you yes. know, they provided comments yeah. on, they yeah. provided the original data and comments on the manuscript. And yeah. so you can really see who yes. yeah. 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 the manuscript yeah. true. it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have another question. Um, it's following up on a question that was asked earlier about knowing when to stop and write. And I think, like, if you're like, okay, I'm stopping here, this is a short paper, there's always more you can do. And so then the question becomes, when do you speculate about, you know, you've, in, you've interpreted your results up to X point, but there can always be more interpretation. And so then, it seems to me like some people like speculating, some reviewers like you to say, okay, well, what could control what you're seeing? But other people hate it. Um, and I, and the one time I did it, I really regretted it. Because um, I published a paper the next year saying no, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, so I guess I was wondering whether, what your takes were on, on speculating. And, um, so yeah, I mean, um, I think, as I said earlier, I, I I see that do I have, out of three key points, do I have two of my key points that are really strong? And um, when I, I generally avoid speculation, but sometimes the reviewer asks you, like, okay, this could also be possible. And so in my responses, I generally try to do a short experiment to investigate that possibility. For example, in one of my papers, I, I made a statement that 
I was looking at three different meteorological configurations and we know that the sea salt emissions depends on wind speed. So I made a statement that, okay, the wind speed in this particular configuration is higher. So we expect sea salt emissions to be higher um, in that case. And the reviewer came back and asked, do you really see it? And so we had a mini kind of three member uh, study and going over four months, obviously I cannot repeat the experiment. So in my responses, I just took two days and uh, I showed that there is a positive relationship between wind speed and uh, sea salt emissions. Um, that was sufficient to satisfy the reviewer. And, uh, but then you also have to write a statement that this is only based on a short period of studies and it would require more exploration. And this is not the main point of the paper. So that's how I generally go about it. Of course, you have to put your results into the context of the overall picture, and you can add a paragraph in your, at the end of your paper saying that my results might have implications for this. Just, just putting the word might opens a lot of new possibilities. Yeah, I think having the one sort of speculative one maybe you're most excited about and then all the other ones are great information for a proposal. <laughs> yeah, I try not. I try not to go too far. You know, I, I speculate within reason and put all the caveats yeah. Yeah, into yeah, that. Yeah. Like, we might be able to think this, but there's all these other things that we need to consider that we haven't. And so, trying not to be too certain. And I have, you know, I think that has changed from when I was a graduate student to now where I used to try and speculate more because I felt like maybe it would have a bigger impact but I definitely got a lot of reviews that were like you can't actually say that or there's so much yeah. uncertainty that um you know I realized that I could I didn't want to overstate my results and so that's um yeah you know that was just yeah. helped bring me in yeah I have a couple of questions and my first question is actually as Rajesh told the list of population is very important so in connection to that uh, how and where does the impact factor that is cumulative impact factor is helpful in our career or in our next position my second question is uh, um, how it is easy or difficult to publish in a journal with an impact factor more than 20 or 25 so honestly, personally, I don't care about the impact factor. I care about uh, the message that I want to convey. And personally, if you look at look like JGR, ACP, Environmental Science and Technology, so you'll see that JGR has a lower impact factor, but I still send most of my papers to JGR because I like their review process. Um, so I care about the message, uh, not the impact factor. And the second question that going to a high impact journal, like maybe nature or science, I, I believe you mean, you, you are referring to those when you say impact factor more than 20. Um, <laughs> those are really, so we, we have to understand that um, the rejection rate is really high. I think somewhere I was reading that nature publishes only eight out of 200 papers they get every year. So we have to understand the rejection rate is really high. So before I go to that journal, if I think that my results are worthy of going into that journal, I don't write the paper. I write the key message, maybe one paragraph summary, and I try to find an editor that is in my field, and I send a pre-submission inquiry. Nature now has an official pre-submission inquiry uh, that you can submit like one page summary of your paper and they can assess whether it is worthy of being published in nature. So by doing that, you would get a feedback and that would save you a lot of time. It's like if you draft the paper in, in, the, in nature or science format and it gets rejected, then it's a lot of work to redraft it. So I try to send the key message first to the editor to, and, and you have to be in your email or in your conversation, you should not be putting the stress on the editor you should say that, of course, I understand that publishing is subjected to peer review, but we would like to inquire whether this message is within the scope of nature or science. And believe me, most of the time you will say no. They will say no because they have 
again, the high, very high rejection rate. Another thing that I've seen recently is uh, because, because of the amount of papers they are getting, they have opened a lot of sister journals, like Nature Climate Change, Nature Communications, Nature Scientific Reports, uh, Science Advances. So most of the time, they will also recommend you to go to those journals, saying that, okay, this would fit within the scope of that journal. So doing a pre-submission inquiry, I found it really useful. Should we move on to other questions? Okay. I'll just add about the, the impact factor thing. There are some, some journals, especially some Elsevier journals, that have really high impact factors, but they gain that by... Rec they won't come out and say it, but they'll basically... The editors will kind of soft require you to cite articles in that journal yeah. Yeah. enough times so that they keep their impact factor up. And so impact factor is often misleading. Like a lot of AMS journals have fairly low impact factors compared to like Elsevier journals. But for the fields that you're, the people that you're trying to reach, those are the journals that they read. Yeah. And so impact factor, you know, can maybe be a consideration, but I don't think should be the be all and all. It's a distraction. Yeah, that's. I also don't pay attention to impact factors. I don't. The one thing that I will say though is it might matter more if you're faculty yeah, at a university. I think so. And, and different so, countries like in yes, Australia, yeah. apparently it's huge. And yeah. so Europe too. Yeah, I, I think that we are very lucky to yeah. be able to say yeah. that because I would agree with what you just said, which is some of these journals don't necessarily have high impact factors, but are well respected journals that are widely read, um, and so. You know, I think I think I think about it more of is this journal respected? Do I know other papers that are published in it? Those kinds of things. Um, but you know, if you are going to target, a, you know, a nature or a science, doing the inquiry first is a really nice thing because you at least even have a sense for you know whether or not this might even be considered because the yeah. it's it's hard to write a full paper and then just yeah. have it rejected because you have to completely Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the other thing too is a lot of these high impact journals, they want you to, you should look at the review criteria because a lot of times I've rejected a lot of these papers because it just doesn't check the boxes that the journal wants of, you know, having this high impact on the field. So like if your work is very good, but it's not answering every single question, you know, <laughs> related to the earth system. Sometimes it's like it's gonna not make it through. Yeah. So I think if you can look at if you can either review for the journal or at least look at the criteria and just make sure that you're kind of meeting those requirements. Because a lot of times I've seen so many nature papers in my field where I I read them and I'm like, what the hell? Like there's so many assumptions that these people made and it was because they wanted a global map or you know whatever. So I think trying to be aware of the scope of your work and how it fits into the journal, I think, is important. But for a preliminary short listing for any position, that the cumulative impact factor is very important. It, sorry, can you say that again? For short listing, for He's preliminary that short listing. You go for a job for short listing, oh. people look at the cumulative impact factor. Yeah, maybe. no. I, yeah, I'm maybe. Not, I, I mean, I've gotten interviews at places where, <laughs> and, and I don't pay attention to those things because I, you know, I don't know. It might, yeah. it might be for some places. Um, and so, it might be worth considering if you're looking across journals that are well respected and you think get similar readership to maybe try for the one that has the highest impact factor. Maybe just to share, coming off a recent faculty search process, um, impact factors did not come up in conversations that I had with hiring committees. I think they were more happy to see kind of what was your potential for external funding, what was, did you have any publications in, you know, at least not kind of the predatory journals, kind of the other side of the coin. Um, but it will vary, certainly, based on yeah. what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. I've been rejected at many places in my job search, and the uh, impact factor was not one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Hi, um, my name's Jennifer. I'm actually not a scientist. I'm the head of the library here at NCAR. Um, and I just wanted to chime in on this topic of journal impact factor and other bibliometric um, ways of assessing um, the, your work, <laughs> um, which is part of the work of the organization. I'm very encouraged to hear that um, that you all don't value journal impact factor and that there is awareness about um, how journals might gain mm -hmm. this system um, in order to uh, 
continue to exercise their current business model. <laughs> um, however, um, the journal impact factor and other bibliometric things such as the H index, which is another way of sort of slicing and dicing the number of citations relative to your publications, these are used by the organization as a whole. Um, so um, the NSF, um, when we report to the NSF, the library supports um, the bibliometric analysis of the publication record of the organization. And at that level, they start talking about journal impact factor. And H index also comes up in the, um, in the ARC, so in your, um, in your promotion and tenure um, process. Um, and so all of that to say, if anyone has questions about these sort of things, which are not really related to you know, your scientific work, um, but are part of this exercise of scholarly communication and how, that, how the impact of that is evaluated, I would definitely encourage you to reach out to the library um, with any questions or um, if you just want to talk about these issues anymore. And when I say reach out to the library in this context, it's probably me that you want to reach out to. <laughs> um, but we can also be reached at um, ncarref at ucar.edu. And we um, typically address those emails based on you know, who has the expertise to answer the question. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Well, <coughs> sorry, yeah. I have a couple of questions from online. And um, given that. We're coming to a close. I think these are kind of inspiring. Um, one of them is, um, how do you get yourself to actually write? <laughs> Science is fun, writing is not. This is for, from one person. And then another person asks, when is a good time to begin to write a paper after most research is done, or little by little with work progress? If you could comment on that the inspiring I it, part. It varies by person, I think. Mm -hmm and what your work ethic is, but when I was finishing my PhD, one person gave me this piece of advice, write one paragraph a day. And sometimes that will kick you into being able to write more, and other times you just need to take a break and walk away from it. And that actually really worked for me. Um, and so it can be one paragraph or one hour or something where you just try and set aside time. But I think having dedicated time, because you write, like I, I don't love to write, but it's a part of what I have to do. And so um, for me, being consistent and writing through, you know, trying to write even little bits every day, even if I don't necessarily have a lot to write, is helpful because it keeps me in that flow. I get really bad writer's block and I can spend like four hours on two sentences, you know, and it's, I just, I can do that to myself and it's a lot easier to do that to myself if I'm not writing consistently. Um, whereas if I write consistently, it's, it also can help me sometimes to write in the evening with a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just figuring out, I think it's choosing to figure out a strategy to love writing, or at least be okay with spending time writing, because it's a requirement of all of our jobs, and figuring, so being committed to figuring out your strategy, and then sticking to it, so like, being creative, like, like I set a lot of timers in my day, like throughout the day, um, doing outlines. I also found that I think a lot better if I'm writing with a pen and paper, mm -hmm. you know, but all this is different for everybody. Yeah. Some people it's writing, you know, making presentations, you know, whatever it is, I think it's just that you have to commit to yourself. Like I have to figure out a way to make this fun or at least feel good <laughs> of like, okay, accomplish something. Yeah. You can always fill your time with other things if you're not yeah. going to commit to the time to mm -hmm. it. And so and you accountability really buddies can be helpful. Yeah. There's also a book called how to write a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think too, like don't don't be afraid of writing something that you're you totally know you're gonna delete later. Like just just spitting it all out, you know. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. really helpful. Revising is a good um, yeah, and I think in terms of when to start writing, I think if you've got you know a couple really solid figures, like the first two key points are kind of figured out. I think that's a good place to to start. Methods are always the easiest for me to start. Yeah, yeah. methods intro. Like I think it's just. Getting an outline, I do a lot of outlines for my papers, which really help me. Again, it's just fine, like choosing consciously. Like I have to figure out a way to like this. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with both, and I think there are two other questions, and we have five minutes because oh, yeah. I need to leave. So maybe we'll take Jared. Yeah, my, mine should be short. Um, so I know in RAL we have a process of you you have a, a good solid draft of a paper before you submit it. It has to be reviewed. 
internally by someone else in RAL. Mm -hmm. Do other labs at NCAR have that same procedure? Ecom follows that because I... UL does. Yeah. CGD does not. CGD okay, does so not. Does CGD. And then ASP is required. ASP is required. And ENL. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't do that. <laughs> I, I think that's really helpful because that's a friendly review. Yes. Someone who you know might have some idea what, what you're doing, but they aren't you know, on the paper. They aren't yeah. intimately familiar, but... I mean, someone in the in your lab isn't going to just rip you. <laughs> but at what stage is that? Is That's that when you're before it's or it's required. So in RAL, it's required before you submit it to the journal. So when it's already pretty far. It, yeah. it has to be. It has to be in a it state has to be a where. Draft, like, you, see, you will submit to the journal. Yeah, it has to be almost almost ready to submit. But it's an internal pre-review just to make sure that. Can yeah. this person be your co-author, or not a co does it have to be an outside person? It has to not be a not, not a co-author, but someone in the lab. Yeah. Yeah, it's also Do all people follow this rule? Uh, well, yeah. I guess I so I've in, never heard in, about that. In WISAP, we follow it. Every paper gets reviewed internally before it gets submitted. I just it wasn't actually a question I just wanted to continue what well, well um, said a little bit is like what really really helped me with writing was an accountability group for writing and then actual sessions where we came together and we called them shut up and write sessions and they worked so well for me um, and then actually a paper on how to write a paper because they gave me structure <laughs> turning off my internet was also a really yes yeah, not checking email because my internet's off and like going to a coffee shop, taking myself out of my normal yeah. situation, those mm -hmm. things that you just have to find what works right. for you. Like I really like early morning, like 5.30 in the morning. My <laughs> husband's still asleep, cat's just sleeping, whatever, and email is more or less quiet and I can get a, like a lot more into one hour period than Yeah, I've started writing period. on the paper. Yeah. That keeps me more focused yeah. um, instead of writing on the computer screen. Yeah. Um, at least the introduction part or the motivation yeah. part. I try to do it in isolation, just having a pen and paper, and then retype it. <laughs> Can I tell us about your accountability group? Um, yeah, sure. Is it like a or should I tell? Yes. Uh, so well, my friend Rebecca Hucker started it, um, and she works in Ecom. And so, I, I guess if anybody wants to like try it out and join, just come to me after this is over. Um, and yeah, we just meet Mondays in the cafeteria and we just check in with each other, we create a plan. We check in with last week, did we, write, did we meet our writing goals and we create a plan for the next week. And it's, it's just worked really well for me. Yeah. So. Yeah, so okay, sorry, I, I need to leave. I have to be at another meeting at exactly 11. So. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Thing for us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for taking their time to talk to us and if you guys want to keep discussing this uh, subject, we actually have a, another workshop or event coming up in two weeks that's going to be a conversation to more senior scientists and editors to see if we can get the other side of mm. the publishing stories. So hopefully it will be useful to you all as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very much.